Hey programmers, welcome back. Hope you had fun in the last exercise set. But for now, we're on to bigger and better things. Why don't we learn about a few more array patterns? And then right after this, we'll do some more exercises together. So to get going, what I have here is just an array for us to mess around with. I just have an array of some people's names. And what I want to do is just show you a few new patterns that you can use. So let's start with a classic pattern. We'll kind of refactor it using the latest and greatest. Some task you'll find yourself doing pretty often is checking whether or not an element is inside of an array. In other words, what if I had some person I wanted to check if they're inside of this people array? So you can actually solve that pattern using index sub in a very classic way. So let me just draw out that pattern. This is just review, right? I can do people dot index of. Now let's say I wanted to check if JJ is in the people array. So index of JJ. If JJ is inside of the array, then I'll get the index where he can be found, right? And so I'd be index two here. But in general, if they're actually in the array, then I get a valid index. That would mean index greater than negative one, right? So this pattern in itself, that is index sub greater than negative one, tells me you know, whether or not the given element is inside of the people array. So I'll run this, just some review, right? So this gives me back true. I can search for someone else that's valid in the array, like Richard. So that totally works. Let's try something that's invalid, like Mary. That would be false, right? And I get false here because in the case of Mary, if I evaluate this left-hand side of the expression, the index of Mary inside of the people array is going to be negative one, right? Because she's not found. Then I check, is negative one greater than negative one? And that statement is false. So that's why I return my final I'll return false over here. There's actually a nice cleaner way to solve this pattern, right? So instead of manually using index of, arrays have a nice method that literally checks if an element includes, right? Without doing this additional comparison. In other words, I don't need to do this index check. Instead of index of, you can use includes, right? And this actually reads really awesome, right? It checks, does people include Mary? So I'll run that. That should be false. Let's look for someone that is there like Betty, right? And that'll give us a nice true. Cool. And so feel free to use this includes method, right? It's really useful for checking if an element is inside of an array. Just bear in mind some details about this method. You could probably guess that the elements need to totally match up. So if I check for capital Betty, that would actually return false. So just bear that little detail in mind. So includes is one method I wanted to show you. And let me show you a few others now. So here's another example. Here I have a sentence string. Notice that it's a string and not an array, right? No tricks here. And a common task you may want to perform is grabbing individual words from this sentence. In other words, I wish I can kind of reference I as one element and then cannot as a separate element and wait as its own element as well. And so unfortunately right now, if you just like index this sentence, right? If you do like sentence dot, let's say index like, I don't know, two, of course, that would still refer to our classic string operation of just grabbing an individual character of the string, right? So if I run this code, I'm just gonna get the C, right? Because C is at index two, right? Zero, one, two. And so by itself, uh, this doesn't give me a way to access the individual words of the sentence. So I wanna teach you a new method. What you can do is use a string method that converts this string into an array. What I can do is sentence.split and when you call the split method, you have to pass in an argument. And what you should pass in is the character that you want to basically cut your string on. So if I want to get an array of the words of the sentence, I know that the words are separated by some space characters. So I'm gonna literally pass in a string containing just one blank space. And let's just see what that returns, right? So what does sentence.split return? If I run this code, notice that it gives me back an array. You can imagine that we took the original string and we just cut wherever there was a space before, right? And we grab everything around those spaces as individual elements. Another important detail about sentence.split is that it returns a new array, right? So what I can do is, in most circumstances, you'd probably want to save this as an array. I'll call it words, nice and semantic. And there I have my nice words array that I can do whatever I want with, right? So words is just a regular array. You can do any other operations, right? You can get as creative as you want with it. Another thing to bear in mind with the split method is it doesn't actually change the sentence, right? It doesn't convert it in any way. It just gives you back a new array. In other words, if I take a look at my original sentence, it's exactly what it was before, right? So don't uh, misconstrue the split method as actually changing your existing sentence. It really just gives you some new array that you can store separately. And so just for fun, what you could do is things like iterate through the words of the sentence now, right? So I have my sentence string, I split on a space, 
Now let me iterate over the words by just using a regular for loop, right? So this is just some review. Go from i equals zero up to words.length and do i plus plus. Notice that right now I'm referring to the length of my words because I want to iterate through every word and not the individual characters of the sentence. And so I'll console.log words at index i. And this will give me every word printed out one by one, right? I cannot wait for dinner. Final thing about the split method is you can split on any character that you want. So it doesn't always have to be a space. So let's say I did sentence.split, but instead of a space, I split on an O. Notice there are a few O's in the string, right? There's an O over here in cannot, and there's also an O in four. And so imagine that I literally took my string and cut it right on those two O's. Let's see what we get. Notice that I get some elements that basically lie around those O's, right? So to the left of this initial O, I have I can with two N's, right? There it is over here. And then after that, I have T wait F, here it is. Then after that second O, I have our dinner. Right, so it's really up to you to design how you want to split you know, your strings. And you don't have to pass single characters. What you could do is pass possibly like a whole substring. So something that I'll maybe try is splitting on the string eight. So I'll try that. Now I'll just get an array filled with two strings, everything to the left of that single eight and everything to the right of eight. And so what you always want to bear in mind is that you use split on a string and that gives you back an array, right? So in general, you wanna be writing string.split and not array.split. But luckily there's actually a very similar method that does the opposite of split, and that is join. So here I'm gonna bring back my old array of people. And so this is an array. And let's say for whatever reason you wanted to combine the elements of this array into a single string. What you can do is say general array dot join, and you can again pass in some separator between your elements. So let's say I wanted just like a dash to separate every element. So I'll type that in over here. Let's see what we get. And this will literally just take all of the elements of the array and put this substring between them. And of course, this actually returns some new data. This returns you a new string. So I'll say let my string equals that. I can print out my string, do whatever I want with it afterwards. But that itself, that join, doesn't actually manipulate or change the people array. So the people array is still intact, right? It's gonna contain all of the original elements, but now I have a nice separate variable called my string. Right, so notice what happened over here. And you can join on whatever you want. So let's say I join on the string LOL. I'm gonna have LOL placed right between uh, every name over here. So nothing too fancy here. Just know that join and split are kind of opposites, right? So in general, you'll be writing array.join to get a string, and you'll be doing string.split to get an array. And so let's take a look at another array pattern that we can find pretty useful. This one's pretty cool because it doesn't use a particular method. It's actually something that we construct through just some code to accomplish a particular task. So here I have this task laid out. What I want to do is write a function that accepts an array of numbers as an argument. And what my function should do is return the smallest number in that array. And if the array is empty, I want to return a null. And we'll talk about that bit in a moment. So let's try to make sense of the example over here. So in the long run, what I want to do is write my own smallest num function, and it takes in an array as an argument. And if I pass in this array of numbers, it should get back three, because three is the smallest number within this array. Likewise, I can give another array of numbers like this, 17 and 20, and I return the smallest number, which is 17. Like they say, if the array is empty, that is the array contains no elements, then return null. And so you may be wondering about this null bit, right? So why does it make sense to return null? Null is a special value in JavaScript and we use it to represent nothingness or emptiness, right? And so what they're saying is, hey, if you have no numbers in the array, then there is no smallest element, right? So return null, return nothing. And we usually have null be distinct from undefined because null represents like the deliberate absence of a value where we know undefined is kind of like that default value that comes up all the time in JavaScript, right? So null is more deliberate. And we don't wanna do something silly like return like zero in this scenario, because that kind of entails that zero was in the array, right? It's weird to return a number in this instance. So that's why we use null because it's something separate from our typical values that still represents nothingness or emptiness. But really the meat of this problem will be kind of driving logic to solve this bit over here. And so let's start working toward the solution here. What I'll start by doing is just defining a function, right? So nothing fancy here. They even tell us that I want a smallest num function. 
So here's my smallest num function. It's gonna take in an array as an argument. I'll call it nums. And I will have to think about a strategy for solving this one. Well, the first thing I'll notice is I do need to choose a single number out of my entire array, potentially, right? And so what I can do is maybe just touch every number of the array, right? How can I write some code that just looks at every single number? And so what I'll do is just write a classic for loop that iterates through an array. So I'll write a for loop, nothing fancy here. I'll say let i equals zero, and then I'll iterate while i is less than nums.length or in general array.length, and I'll hit every index. Right, so this should just iterate through the indices of my nums array. Let me just console.log what i is. So this will give me zero, one, two, three, four printed out. So we'll try that. But I don't wanna print out the indices of these elements. I wanna print out the elements themselves, right? Just so I can see if my code's working so far. So I'll say nums at square bracket i, and there I have my actual elements, right? Five, six, four, three, seven. Cool. And so what I want to do is somehow take these numbers and kind of compare them against each other and really choose the smallest number. In the long run, I wanna be sure to designate three as the smallest number. So something that you can actually do is use an outer variable and then compare every element that you iterate through to that variable. So what I'll say is over here, I'm gonna create a new variable. I'll call it my smallest. And I can initialize it to some default value. Maybe by default, we'll make sure that the first element of the array is just taken as the smallest, although we may change it over time. So how do I get the first element of an array? Well, it's just the element at index zero. So I'll say, give me nums at index zero. So in this particular example, smallest will be five at the start. And then from there, I wanna start just iterating through the rest of my elements and check them. So what I don't need to do is actually begin this for loop at index zero, because that'd be checking five again, but I already have five stored as my smallest. So instead I'll start one after. I'll start the second element, which is at index one. And so this for loop will now begin to iterate through the other elements, right? And they're gonna be captured in this expression. Maybe just for clarity, I'm going to choose to save this expression in its own variable. So I'll say let my num equal nums at index i, just so I don't have to keep saying square bracket i, because I anticipate me saying it a few times here. And so now that I have the num from the array, I want to check if this number is smaller than the variable I have stored, then I should replace it. In other words, if the number I'm iterating through, if it's smaller than the sm supposed smallest that I'm currently tracking, then I know that this element num should be the winner so far. So I should set smallest to be that number. All right, so this is some really important logic. Let's maybe describe it in some English comments. So I'll say, hey, if the num I'm iterating through is smaller than the smallest I have currently stored, then replace the smallest with that num. And so this would be like the English translation of this if statement combined with the for loop, right? So again, just to review, iterating through the other elements of the array, and for every element, for every number I grab, I check. If that number is less than the smallest, then I'll make that number become the smallest, right? So I'm getting rid of the old number and just putting that new smaller number in its place. And if I do this comparison for all other elements of the array, then by the end of my function, when I return the smallest, it will be the actual smallest number. So let's try this and let's give this a run. So for my smallest num, example over here, I'll console.log the return value. That way we can actually see it. And I hope to get the value three. Nice, and there we have it. So let's step through this one a little closer and I'll trace through all the variables over time. So out the gate, now, uh, when we're stepping through this one, I know that my smallest is gonna become, by default, the first element of the array. So right now my smallest is five, cool. Then as I iterate with my for loop, my for loop really begins at index one. So that means my num is going to refer to six. And I check, is six less than five? That statement is false, right? So I don't do any replacement here, five stays, which makes sense. Next iteration, I look at the next element, which is four, and I check is four less than smallest? That is, is four less than five? That's true, so I replace five with the four. 
Next iteration, I check my num as three, and I check is three less than smallest, that is, is three less than four, that's true, so I replace four with that three, right? Final iteration, my num is seven, and I check is seven less than smallest, that is, is seven less than three, that's false, so I don't do any replacement, and three gets to stay. I've just finished iterating through the length of my nums array, so I go to any code after the for loop, which means I return smallest, which I just said contains three. All right, so this is a pretty nice solution. Let's go ahead and run all of the examples. And we'll notice something interesting here. So let's give it a go. So the first and second examples are totally working, but the third one isn't working out so great, right? So the problem stated that we should have returned null, but right now we're returning undefined. Let's try to understand why that is. So I'm gonna focus my attention on that third example, and it's gonna be pretty simple to fix. So what happens in this code? Well, we pass in an empty array as our nums. So on line seven, when we grab our smallest variable, we're gonna default it to the first element of that array. There is no first element of this array though, because it's empty. And so when we grab an element from there, we're actually gonna get undefined and we're gonna store it in this variable. And then we try to check our for loop and we check. We set i equal to one and we compare that against nums.length, but nums.length is zero because I just said it's an empty array. So this would check is one, right? Because our index starts at one, is one less than zero. That's false. So I don't run any of the for loop and I just go ahead and return smallest, which is undefined, right? And so this scenario is really easy to solve. You actually just want to handle it with an explicit if statement, right? So I consider this a very special case, right? If the array is empty, then just automatically return null. So nothing too fancy here, right? So I'll just go ahead and say at the tippy top, hey, if the nums array is empty, that is, if its length is exactly zero, then there's nothing much to do but return null because there is no smallest number to actually return. Remember that when we return any value, we stop the function immediately and go back to where we called the function, right? So if I return null over here, that would skip all of this code. So let's try all of our examples now. And there we have our solution for this smallest number logic. All right, programmers, that's all I got for this lecture. In the next video, we're gonna work through some exercises, of course, and leverage everything we learned, right? That way we have full mastery of these things.